Well, welcome everybody. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinars on parameter options in challenging cases. My name is Monica Fischer. I am the Senior Market Manager for Parameter at Huckstra Diagnostics in Switzerland, the headquarters. And it's my pleasure to have you all here today. All right, and now it's my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker. Um, it's probably not um, the one you signed up for. Um, this talk's been subject to Murphy's Law, whatever can go wrong goes wrong. Um, both the, um, Dr. Randy Craven and also Dr. Reese, who was signed up as a replacement speaker, had to um, cancel at various times uh, due to health reasons of themselves, um, leaving us um, always running around to find um, a replacement. And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you um, today's speaker. Um, Dr. Rangaraj, um, he's a ophthalmologist at Premier Eye Care and Surgical Center in Mylapur, Chennai in India. Um, in his practice, he focuses on glaucoma management and surgery as well as cataract surgery, um, catering mainly um, to the premium segment. He has contributed several chapters on visual field testing to a variety of dynamic tech textbooks and is teaching regularly, regularly on visual field testing and the various options available to glucose clinicians. He has an in-depth experience on the octopus perimeter and has served as a medical advisor for Hoxtride for more than 15 years. So I know he's an excellent teacher and it's my pleasure um, that he's here with us today. So welcome, Dr. Rangaraj. Thank you for coming at such short notice. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much and namaste from India. So actually my topic, uh, which was given to me was the perimetry options in challenging cases. And I'm sure as clinicians, uh, we face these challenges every day. It's not that uh, we don't face challenges. Yes, we do face challenges constantly. So one more. These are my financial disclosures. And just a small introduction of glaucoma. It's, it's a leading cause of visual morbidity and almost 10% will become blind bilaterally. Even mild visual fields can, can affect your quality of life. And whatever may be uh, the type of management we give, 10% of glaucomas will go, treated glaucomas will go into significant visual impairment. So diagnose glaucoma early and manage the advanced cases well, that would be the secret. Glaucoma prevalence in India is quite high. It's almost like the population of a small country in Europe. And we see an equal proportion of open and closed angle glaucoma. And in urban settings, we see almost 2% in our clinics, which means a 40 plus population. When we see 100 people, we are likely to see almost two people with glaucoma. And India also has an expanding aging population because our life expectancy is getting better. And we're going to see a flood of these. So when we look at the natural history of glaucoma, it's something normal and the undetectable diseases when the accelerated apoptosis Ganglion cell death, axon loss, everything is occurring. And these are areas which we hardly ever get to see or diagnose. And SWAP was supposed to diagnose disease a little earlier than the white on white perimetry, but it didn't live up to its image. Now, when we first detect early changes in the visual field, you must remember that untreated glaucoma may cause blindness in three to 15 years, depending on the age and IOP, which are two most important factors for progression. And between moderate changes to severe changes is a challenge for the patient. So what I'm going to do is basically, I'm going to give case-based perimetric challenges of early diagnosis, how I use in my daily clinic, um, how do I use the automated perimeter and imaging to diagnose early, overlapping diseases of cataract and glaucoma, managing the follow-up with its challenges of compliance of medication, compliance of frequency of visit and worsening. And how do you manage end-stage disease? And what are the 
tools we have in the perimetry software now to manage that. Traditionally, diagnosis and even today is based on characteristic visual field or functional changes which occur on white and white perimetry with structural changes which occur on the optic nerve head and the nerve, retinal nerve fiber. Now, structure and function with perimetry software when made easy makes it very easy for us when we are in the busy clinic. So, perimetry software which extrapolates function as a structural representation makes it very easy for you. Like I displayed the grayscale, which is actually from the comparisons, which means it has been indexed for age. It focuses the topography of the defect. Not that we use these color scales on for diagnosis. Then it also tells you the orientation you expect to see on the disc with the notching typically occurring there. And of course, I will interspread this with clinical examples of how I use these perimetry software tools for diagnosis and for progression analysis. The problem lies in perimetry changes which are logarithmic and the structural changes are linear. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, when the first 5 million retinal ganglion cells are being lost, we lose about maybe 3 dB in perimetry. But when the next 2 million retinal ganglion cells are lost, we lose almost 10% of that, which is pretty high. And this is something which happens, especially in early glaucoma. And we find, yeah, structure and function do not seem to correlate to each other. But one is logarithmic and one is linear. And then when we have advanced visual fields, which can be from moderate to severe, we have problems of high false negatives and wide test with retest values. Why do we have these? And what are the softwares we can use by increasing the dynamic range of testing and also the binocular visual field summation, which gives us a sense of how the patient actually is managing the vision. So we'll get into the cases straight away. Case one is a diagnosis for very, very early case. It's a 47 year old female having best corrected visual acuity of 20, 20 or six by six with last line N6. Slip time was unremarkable with IOPs of 18, both eyes at 4 p.m. And uh, when I looked at the fundus, everything looked almost normal. You can see uh, the nerve fibers extending. You can see that, but you know, you have this small little black spot here. Now this black spot happened to be a small little hemorrhage and visual fields straight away showed up two spots, which are actually corrected comparisons which means it is indexed for age as well as the diffuse defect. And it occurs in an area where you expect to find a defect or loss in sensitivity. And sure enough, the corrected probabilities show that in less than 5% of patients, you're going to find these kind of defects. But what I liked most was the representation. We have the same raw values. So it is the way you use I call it tools, or you can say representation, that it shows up and highlights what we are looking at. So we have a 2.3 decibel deviation at 1% significance in the arcuate area, which corresponds to that small hemorrhage which you saw there. Now, these are sector MDs. So you have five sectors in the superior field and five sectors in the inferior field. The main defect as a simple index is the full visual field reduced to a single number. So when you have lots of normal averages, this gets suppressed completely and can be missed on cursory examination. So a good clinical examination and a visual field, if you are able to perform, if your technician is able to perform properly, you can see these kind of sector deviations and you know for sure that you are dealing with glaucoma. And when I looked at the polar analysis, there were two, three red bars here. These are the fiber angles to the tested spots, which is extrapolated to the structure. And when you superimpose that, it sure enough sits exactly at that point. So you can actually look clinically with a 78 diopter lens or with a fundus photo and see whether you have the notch or do you have nerve fiber loss in that area? 
So structural extrapolation of visual function data in ISOOT representation is an important tool. So it orients you to see where the defect is. And then, of course, we now have access to OCTs and things like that. So when I did a RNFL, RNFL is typically taken in a diameter of 3.4 millimeters. And sure enough, it missed. It missed that subtle changes in the axonal uh, loss had not yet reached the rim because the valerian degeneration occurs and then it has not yet reached there. So it appears completely normal. So we think that OCT is the panacea to everything. No, I think it's probably good clinical diagnosis, attention to detail, looking for such defects which represent glaucoma, which is the disease which we are investigating. And this is the macula map, which is almost normal. Yes, there is some amount of thinning which occurs in the expected area in probably uh, may progress further. But for all practical purposes, it is normal. So this is almost completely normal. So it's actually a focal defect with green disease is what we are seeing. So in this case, I would summarize that the corrected cluster analysis the polar analysis display the early focal defect is what picked up. The cluster analysis picked up the early defect because it was a sector MD. So the sector MD picked it up and it made things easy for me. So even if you compare two hemi fields, you could still miss that. So isoot representation and fundus picture correlate and confirm. When I mean fundus picture, it means clinical examination too. You don't need to have a fundus picture to actually correlate the two. So you can have an OCT which is completely normal and you can call it a green disease. So this highlights that good clinical examination and perimetry, you can pick up early diagnosis. The next case, so this patient presented with defective vision and slit lamp showed cataracts in both eyes. You can see the fundus pictures are fuzzy and IOPs of course was, um, 24 uh, mm Hg, both eyes. And on detailed examination, I find something wrong with the rim, with the neuroretinal rim. There is, seems to be a notch. And the left eye, I mean, the right eye showed a patch of dark area, which, is, which indicates uh, nerve fiber loss. And sure enough, these are the areas we got to look for. So a visual field was done. And sure enough, this is a left on right this is a left to right printout which is very easy to understand and the you see the nasal step here so the gray scales which are from the corrected comparisons which means it has been indexed for age shows up the topography of the defect and glaucoma you should remember is a patterned kind of defect which when you recognize the pattern indicates that you're looking at glaucoma. And uh, I like the baby curve. It shows diffuse defect in both eyes and it also shows the focal defect. So this display actually shows you that there are two overlapping things. So you have the cataract which caused the diffuse defect and then you also have the focal defects. And when you have the corrected comparisons, it shows all these values. And you can see that these values across the median are quite high and indicates disease state and visual field deficit. And of course, the statistical packages, which is the corrected probabilities, tells you that these points are significant at 0.5%. So which means only 0.5% of the population will have this as normal, which means it's really abnormal. And the structure representation was very interesting because this is what you extrapolate onto the structure when you see the retina and the optic disc. And uh, when you have a fundus photo, it makes it easy. And this is where the defects are. And uh, this is where you extrapolate the structural function. This is, of course, I have photoshopped it. This is not the way it does in a software, but it's just a sense of orientation. And sure enough, when you use OCT, it works at 880 nanometer infrared. So even if you have opacities, you can still see the amount of uh, loss. 
and it is at the inferior temporal, which is the most common site which you will find defects occurring. And it's well within the circle, so you can see the highlight as uh, red. And this is how it looks when you extrapolate the polar picture. So the learning was that the dis that the defect curve showed you. So basically, what I'm trying to uh, convey is that each of these representations have a certain value to the diagnosis. So the defect curve shows you uniform depression with the focal defect. The corrected comparisons displayed the nascent step despite the media haze because what it does is it takes the, the actual diffuse defect and then subtracts it and then gives you the presentation and the polar graph points to the area to look at for structural changes on the optic disc. So if you have infrared photography, you could pick it up even if you have a cataract which is nuclear sclerosis grade 3, grade 4, grade 5. And of course, we have the stable glaucomas, uh, IOP around 11 uh, millimeters and they are on follow-up. So how do we follow up these patients? So th this case will highlight how you need to follow up and what is what are the parameters I'm looking at when I do the follow up. This is a stable glaucoma and she's been coming regularly for our checkups. This is 2015 and 2019. And this is how the corrected comparisons look. I go straight for the corrected comparisons because it takes care of the diffuse defect if at all there is any, if there is any signs of opacity in the lens. And uh, 2019, yes, there are some more uh, spots which are flagged, the tested spots which are flagged with numbers, which indicates that they are abnormal. One good thing about octopus readings is when it is plus, you know, it is within the normal bandwidth of four decibels. And you know, when that exceeds the four decibels, it tells you how much it is deviated. So this is the follow up from 2015 to 2019. But when I looked at this, I was not very convinced. I wanted to see if there are any outliers. And the moment I deselected the outlier, which was in 2017, the whole picture starts to light up. And you see that there is something happening at significance of 1% and a fluctuation at 5%. And sure enough, the, S, uh, the, M, the SLV shows up, the LD shows up, which means certain sectors are involved. And sure enough, these are the two sectors involved. So when you do a, a same clusters and put them together over time, it becomes the, the trend, the cluster trend. So it can be a corrected cluster trend or it can be a cluster trend where you don't look for the diffuse defect. So it does show you that there is worsening which is occurring at 5% significance in both these areas. Okay, when this is happening, what is happening on the disk is what I want like to know. And for that I have the actual polar trend analysis, which tells me where to look for the defect. And this is how the pictures were from 2015 to 2019. I'm just showing a few highlights. And in between, despite her IOP at 11, which we would consider, uh, I mean, extremely okay, she had a splinter heme in 2016, which converted to a retinal nerve fiber loss in 2019. And that accounted for some more visual uh, spots which were tested in the arcuate area to show defect. But when you have these kind of images, there is no quantification of the RNFL loss. So it's an approximation. You, In case if you're not having an OCT, what we do is we look at all these blood vessels and quantify how much of it is lost and make an uh, annotation on that. When you take an OCT RNFL map, I normally rely on a difference map. Difference map means, so I start with the baseline and I see what is the difference which occurs over time. And sure enough, there is some flagging. And when I do a 12 sector analysis, it shows the inferior temporal showing red and the P values are definitely significant in this patient. So you did have a splinter hemorrhages, which initially means an infarction and then you have the retinal nerve fiber loss. So you know that despite having a high pressure of 11, this patient is progressing. And this is the 12 sector, which I am 
showing you and the significance of that. So summarizing this case, what is it that I used to make this diagnosis that she is progressing? A good baseline selection, which means you should have a reliable visual field when you start up. Then customize your frequency of fields, which is done per year. If it is a new case, I would do three and I would counsel my patient. I think communication and counseling is very important. I would counsel my patients to come back at least three times a year. And in India, they pay out of pocket. So you have to be really sensitive about these things and tell them why is it that they come and why is it that they have to do and use short strategies. There is no point in using dynamic. I don't use dynamic for follow up. I use top because once the visual field indices is what I'm going to follow, I just do the follow up with the visual field indices. And that is what tells me whether there is a deterioration or not. And shorter your strategy, strategy is how you test and program is where you test. So I would put a short strategy. This is an incentive for the patient to come back and do the test. And I have used the, the cluster analysis and polar trends, especially when the defects are very early. That is when you need to use them. And you correlate these with structural images and quantify that deterioration with an OCT 12 sector RNA, uh, I mean the retinal nerve fiber layer display. So it's clinical judgment, counseling the patient, using a short strategy, which makes the patient to come back for compliance. So typically I would recommend a frequency of three times a year in the first year. And if it is stable in those uh, first year, I would do it maybe two times a year in the next two years and then make it yearly follow up if everything has stabilized. That's the pattern I follow here in India. Case four was a follow up of a 57 year old female and her IOPs were under good control as early as 2014 visit and brother and sister both having POAG, they, they have glaucoma even among the relatives and underwent cataract surgery in 2015 and she stopped medication on the advice of the neighbor. So I think communications by doctor, I think we seem to be the biggest barrier when we did a survey with the patients that doctors are the barrier. So we have a counselor now to ask these questions and tell them why they need to do that. And she presented in mid 15, 2015, with IOPs of 23 millimeters. And her last visit in 2019 was 12 millimeters of, of hemoglobin. So let us look at how the progression was. What I'm going to highlight in this case is the timeline. If you see, Octopus has a default selection of six tests. And there is a reason for that. So I will highlight that reason now. These arrows actually indicates point of interest. I will go through that from the beginning. So what happens is in 2011, when she first came, her MD values were in the normal. And then slowly it started to depress, which means she had cataracts. And, and you can see the diffuse defect also showing that. And then she underwent surgery and then she came back to normal. And this is when she decided that she would stop the medicines. And then this is when she was restarted and six more fields show that she is not deteriorating. So there was no progression 2010 to 2012. Then she had cataract surgery. And then that was the post-op period. And then she stopped the eye drops. That is when the whole screen kind of lit up. I showed her the screen and told her that, look, this is not the way you kind of treat your uh, disease because this is slow but irreversible disease. And in fact, she has the experience of a brother who is a physician who stopped driving. She was counseled and then she was asked to restart the drops. And this is how the global progression looked. And this is how the cluster trend analysis looked. And what is more important is the papillomacular bundles were also affected, including the nasal step. So if this further deteriorates, she's going to have moderate to severe loss of vision. And this is how the polar analysis, the polar trend analysis looked like. And 
you can sure enough see the hemorrhage here, which indicates that, which is a clinical indicator that progression is occurring. Now, the problem is when we take wrong selections, we end up probably over treating or maybe do a surgery. So that is why when you find abnormal visual field in your follow-up, make sure that you retest them again and follow them up and it should be reproducible. And that is when you realize that, yes, this is a change and I need to intervene. Of course, in the last six uh, visual fields in the timeline from 2017 to 2019, it is absolutely flat and there has been no progression. So, which means just a counseling and asking if she's putting the drops, if she has any problems with that, not asking direct questions and indirect questions, sorted this problem out. And there has been no worsening over this timeline. So, the tools I used here was I tracked the global indices. See, I, it's not that we don't use global indices. Yes, we do induce these. Look at the global indices, the cluster, and the polar trends. And I think the most important every visit we do is communications. We have interns, each person talking to a patient, whether they are, we have a checklist for that, which we use. And then we ask them these standard questions. Sometimes standard questions tend to become routine and people just check mark. I mean, they just kind of tick mark the check boxes. Instead, they are asked to talk. Set up a new baseline when you uh, when there has been a surgery like cataract because the diffuse defect will go away and then you make sure that you restart the baseline from there. Like in this case, we restarted the medication in 2016 and after the surgical intervention. Again, I restarted the baseline. So when she did not use the drops, that was not my baseline. My baseline was after she started the drops and three months later was my baseline. And from there, six tests onwards, showed no progression. So selecting the timeline is extremely important and it is a clinical decision which you got to make with each patient and individualize it for them. And progression or change should be reproducible, correlate the clinical examination with structure and function. This was very interesting. This 54 year old lady came for a second opinion for glaucoma. She just said glaucoma, which means she was not counseled on what type of glaucoma it was, whether it was open, a secondary or a complicated glaucoma, nothing. She was diagnosed as glaucoma elsewhere and she was on all the medications. She was on prostaglandins, beta blockers, lubricants, because you're putting a lot of uh, drops. You want to keep the tear film intact and antihistamines because she was complaining of allergy because of excessive drops. And she was told that she has a thick cornea and dry eye. When you put this much drops, you will get a little bit of dry eye. Her visual acuities were six by six and six, both eyes, 20, 20 vision. And the visual field was done one year back with the eye hospital. So there was no follow up visual field. There was no communication with the patient and pachymetry was 578 microns and 550 microns. In India, we normally see an average of about 510 to 520 microns. And IOP with Goldman Applanation Tonometer was 24. So what they did was they subtracted for the thickness and said, yeah, yeah, you're within normal, within 18. But the fact remains is that central corneal thickness by itself is not responsible for any glaucoma or it's not an independent factor. Anterior segment examination showed a very shallow peripheral anterior chamber. Gonioscopy showed synechial closure almost 180 degrees. And fundus undilated, you can do a clinical examination too. I, I, I have access to a, a non mediatic camera. So this is the photograph. And you can clearly see the little notch here. And you can also see this dark shadow here in the red free. I like the red free because it shows up the, ner the, the nerve fiber loss very well. And you know what you're looking at. And the diagnosis is straightforward. And this is the nerve fiber loss here. The visual fields was almost looking normal. Well, cursory glance, yes, everything seems, the numbers are all okay, the clusters are fine, everything is good. 
which means there is a discrepancy between the visual function reserve which a patient has versus the damage which has occurred. So you can have damage and if your visual reserve is enough, it does not yet tip the balance to show up, but you can pick up early. I will show that in the next couple of slides. So there is one place which shows up that there is some problem. Now, I would say that by statistical chance that one place is probably, you know, by statistics, uh, I mean, by, I mean, the statistics can be used in both ways. You can say that this by statistical chance is normal, but I can say it is abnormal because it is in the expected area of the defect. I think that is the key. So when you see abnormal numbers coming up in an area which you expect to see, then it is for real. But if it occurred, say, maybe, you know, uh, nasally, I wouldn't be too worried. And sure enough, when I looked at the fiber angle, there were a few lines which showed up, which correspond to the notch here. You can see the neuroretinal rim, and it is not following the isn't rule. The inferior, superior nasal temporal thickness usually follows the isn't rule. There is a nice notch here, and it corresponds to the defect. So we are looking at a diagnosis of angle closure glaucoma with nerve fiber loss, which has already occurred because of the high eye pressure. And this is how the angle closure looked like before the iridotomy, and then it opened well after post yard. So these, we normally take these two pictures because it highlights to the patient about the seriousness of the disease and they understand what is there. And let me tell you that anterior segment OCT and image analysis is not the guideline to diagnose angle closure. It gives a good image, that's about it. It still is gonioscopy, like a Sussman flat base, which you can do an indentation gonioscopy, check it out and then use the tools in the perimetry to highlight what you have seen. So when attention is given to these details, you do see all these important highlights which come up. So the lesson learned was slit lamp examination was the basic which highlighted the shallow anterior chamber and gonioscopy showed cyanic closure, which one year back would have been oppositional when a YAG BI alone may have been useful. Anterior segment uh, ima uh, imaging is not at all essential. You don't need to do an UVM and OCD to diagnose angle closure. The visual field picked up the functional loss with, polar, uh, with, the, with the polar analysis, which correlated with the disc photo. What I mean is that where you expected the defect, you found even in the functional loss, even though it was just one, one little spot, one test spot. So the main clinching uh, history here was leading questions in the initial stage. Do you have headaches? Do you have dull vision with blurring? When I asked her these leading questions, she said, this is why I wanted a second opinion. So sometimes I think communications with leading questions, being very objective and giving a thorough clinical examination probably solves the problem for the patient and the doctor. So let's just move on to advanced visual field losses. Now, when we have advanced visual field loss, what happens is you have high false negatives. The moment you have high false negatives, you say, no, I'm not going to use the test. Retest again. The problem is with advanced visual field loss, you are going to have a test raised, retest values which are going to be wildly varying. The reason is because when you go to the edge of the scotoma and the normal, you're going to have a frequency of seeing curve which is absolutely flat. So you have a variation of six decibels, give or take, three decibels negative, three decibels positive. And you can mitigate this with, of course, software tools by increasing the dynamic range. I'll come to that in the next few slides. Now, false negative responses in glaucoma perimetry, are they indicators for patient performance or is it test reliability? 
Higher false negative frequencies are found in eyes with glaucomatous visual field loss compared with unaffected eyes. So when people have defects, there is going to be false negatives. It doesn't mean you have to disregard that particular field test, but it only highlights the extent of visual disability they have. And you must remember that people having glaucoma have a loss in the contrast sensitivity too. So there is a diffuse loss in that also. And that is one reason why we don't advise multifocal lenses for people having glaucoma. It's because multifocal lenses themselves cause a deterioration in the contrast sensitivity and the contrast sensitivity in a glaucoma patient is definitely low. Just look at the false negatives in normal healthy eyes. It's within 15%. And in glaucomatous eyes, it can reach up to 45 to 50% depending on the extent of defect. And there is a wide test to retest. This is a very interesting graph. Now, high retest variability for size 3 stimulus begins approximately at 25 decibels. And by the time you reach 5 decibels down, the limit has extended to almost the entire measurement range of the instrument. And you'll find the same thing happening with size 5 stimulus. So I will introduce to you the size 5 stimulus. So, size 5 testing gave results which are similar to size 3 testings and these are the controls in this study. So, what are the software tools we can use to increase the dynamic range? Dynamic range is to extend the amount a person can see and how do you do the binocular visual field summation? It's a very interesting concept because it tells us how the patient is actually visualizing the world. And it also tells them how serious their disease is. You can counsel them on many things. Now, increasing the dynamic range, the first thing we can do is to increase the stimulus size. And these are the stimuli, the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We normally use the size 3 stimulus, which is from the Goldman era. And most of us, anything other than 3, it's not a comfortable range for us. And you can put 10 of these into, an, into a, a blind spot. And when you take size 5, you can put around 3 of them inside. So which means they are big enough, but well worth a try for you in advanced to moderate in uh, advanced to moderately advanced cases. Now, what is what is the peculiar? Uh, I mean, what is the highlight of size 5? It reaches more intact retinal ganglion cells. When you have normal uh, subjects, definitely size 3 will touch something. And you, you should be able to get a few intact uh, retinal ganglion cells. But when there is advanced pathology, there can be just areas where there is no response. Whereas if it is size 5, there will be a response. And the problem is visual field perimetry is a very subjective test. So when there is a subjective test, you shouldn't dishearten your patients. You get worse fields. So do we really use size 5? So these are the quartile regressions of size 3 and size 5 in glaucoma patients, you can see that it's more or less corresponding to that. And the insert shows, of course, the 28 normals. This was done, study published in 2013. But it took me quite some time to realize the importance of size 5. Of course, this was presented in uh, Faficon and uh, Dr. Chris Johnson is there in the audience. That was a very interesting talk. So, when to switch stimulus size. So stimulus size 3 and 5 are not directly comparable. In fact, there is one log difference between the two. So use stimulus 5 only for patients for whom testing stimulus 3 is no longer gives you any good clinical results. And there is floor effect and there is a large variability as far as stimulus 3 is concerned. So if you start getting too many false negatives, there's large variability and there is no meaningful conclusion to the uh, test you're doing because any test which is done has a cost in terms of for the patient as well as the time you spend with the patient. So spending the time usefully is probably the decision which we as clinicians should make when to switch from 3 to 5. You can also increase the dynamic range by taking from 100 milliseconds to 200 milliseconds. Octopus uses 100 milliseconds in their uh, stimulus 3 in the normal programs, Humphrey uses 200 
and anything more than 200 initiates fixation reflex so you have to be within that bandwidth so you have a size 5 and you have 200 milliseconds and that should increase the dynamic range quite a bit this is an example which this is courtesy of heart straight i do not have uh, follow ups with uh, 3 and four, 3 and 5 right now i think i should get it in about a year i should have and this is how the size 3 stimulus looks like and you can see that the false negatives are around 14% when the deterioration is this much and how does it look on size 5 it looks like this don't look at these so look at the gray scale and see how much of deterioration is there so this is low vision central and then when you look at this then is when it tells you that almost 57 percent false negatives when you have false negatives like this it disheartens the patient and it, they you may even lose them for follow-up and this is how it looks so at least we have an idea about how much the patient can approximately see i'm sure the contrast sensitivity would have come down and we go back to the three and we go to the five so i think there will be an initial learning when we are doing this so between three and five is when we'll be switching because we're very comfortable with size three stimulus and then size five and maybe over time we will switch to five now when you have advanced visual field loss the binocular visual field summation is an important report as to why this patient came late for diagnosis because the binocular visual field compensates it very well so when you have advanced defects like these in one eye in the left eye and in the right eye near normal it's a completely normal visual field you'll notice that the temporal which would have been obstructed by the nose has been very well compensated in the binocular visual field so the patient didn't even realize that until one day they checked it and this is how it looked so this is another lady this is very classic we do see this in india aged about 55 presented with sudden defective vision in the left eye of three weeks duration no pain visual acuity of 6 by 12 in the right eye and left eye hand movements close to face and she didn't even realize she has a problem and, and the intraocular pressure was 38 uh, in both eyes and the gonioscopy showed as usual sinical closure like i said in india we have 50 percent closures and and 50 percent which are open and as you go more towards the east it becomes in mongolia it's almost 94 percent are narrow angles so the clinical setting in which you're working is also important and be sensitive to the area at which you're working with optic disc which i could see and i couldn't take a photograph because the pupils were very small and there was no question i could dilate with indirect ophthalmoscopy estimated a cupping of 0.8 and left eye was pale optic disc with advanced glaucomatous cupping she was advised topical medications and a yag laser uh, peripheral idotomy which she underwent and this is how it looked on presentation you can see that complete apposition and sinical closure and this is how it looked with size 3 now this is the right eye and with the left eye i couldn't get any result at all because she couldn't perform it with size 3 this is size 3 this is white on white size 3 so what i did was i switched to size 5 with low vision program and sure enough i did see something in the left and i see something in the right now we would wonder why this patient came in so late when she has such severe visual field defects now this is very good for me because i can follow up that little residual vision in the left eye and make sure that the intraocular pressure is maintained very well so these tools which we have hidden in the software of isu is what helps me to show what the patient has and effectively communicate that to the patient summarizing this case it's a case of angle closure glaucoma both eyes ambulation i asked her what she did before and how she moved about ambulation was slow but comfortable before she had this sudden loss her binocular visual field kept her going and the late presentation occurred only when the left eye macula was affected that's when she realized she has a problem her iop now with goldman applanation tonometer is 18 millimeters 
now under control with topical medications and yaglaser iridotomy in both eyes and awaiting further intervention after glycemic control because she was also a diabetic. She has a grade two nuclear uh, sclerotic cataract and hence a cataract surgery with gonio devices is being considered and her axial length was also around 21.4 millimeters. It's uh, like a rather short eye. So a lot of clinical decisions can be made, clinical examinations to be done and utilizing tools which are offered and your technical people should be sensitive to these changes and keep them in the loop. So I have a CME for them every three to four months, case based, so that they become sensitive to these things. So you'll find by the time you have got your uh, workup, mostly everything is done. Thank you for your attention. I would be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Rangaraj, for these very interesting cases um, and also the tools uh, that are available to you um, as an octopus user that you can use. Um, we have a first kind of qu question comment um, saying that Stimulus 5 is more, that patients like the Stimulus 5 better than they like the free. Is that your experience as well? Uh, my experience is actually limited in this because I'm into... Uh, stimulus 5 only in the recent uh, times because I think when I had uh, a choice which I could pick, like for example I can pick low vision with top I can pick low vision with dynamic and I can also uh, tailor make the program whether I can have a G program or a 24-2 if, if I was a Humphrey user so basically uh, it gives you all these possibilities, so I would from now for moderate to severe do both the tests. I would use uh, three as well as five and tell the patient what we are doing. See, when you value add a patient's time, they are willing to give that. Again, it's the communication part of it. So if you communicate why you're doing it and we're doing it at the same cost. So all these are price sensitive. It's not that patients here are insured. Patients pay out of pocket. So we have to tell them why they are doing it and what is the benefit they're going to get from it. And that sets the tone for the follow-up. Right. And I think, um, I mean, that's just my personal experience, um, not being a patient, but I mean, this 16 times larger area of the stimulus five obviously makes it much more visible to the patient yes. and much, much easier to work with. Um, there's another question here on, which is like, so, Stimulus five, um, I thought there are no normative values. So how do I get this, all this analysis? And if I may, um, I answer that because it's, it's a recent addition to the octopus um, perimeter that we do have normative values now for full fields and for the standard programs like the G, the 24-2, 30-2, not for the macular programs because the points are too close together. Um, and, and basically, you can do anything you can do with free. Um, you can do the cluster analysis. You can do trend analysis. Uh, you can't mix them, right? It's still a three and a five. But you, you can put them all together. Um, and you, you get the same type of printouts. Um, and, and I think here, here's an and, interesting... Uh, as yeah. a matter of fact, I would like to just add a comment on that. We are not looking for normative databases because we are doing follow-up. I didn't put that... I have a very favorite slide which says diagnosis versus follow-up. In diagnosis, you're making a new diagnosis. In follow-up, okay. you're almost, almost diagnosed. And same way, once you're diagnosed, you're looking only for any progression. So you're looking at this individual's visual field, which is deteriorating over time. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm not really comparing it with the same age match. When I'm making a diagnosis, yes, it, it does. And if I have normative database, it does help. But right. if I'm using size five, I'm, I'm having an advanced defect, which is showing up in the visual field. The optic nerve is damaged. We are trying to see how we can control the IOP. Unfortunately, in glaucoma, the only control we have is the intraocular pressure. And of course, age is what you age over time. Mm -hmm. That's the comment I wanted to add. Sure. Yeah, and I think that's a good one. Um, so here, here's another very interesting question. Um, so what, 
obviously um, the, your recommendations for when switching to a, from a free to a five is much appreciated. Um, but do you have any recommendations when to switch from static to kinetic perimetry in end stage disease? Or do you use kinetic at all? Um, see, in, in India, we don't use that much of kinetic perimetry for reasons because when we train, uh, there is no accent on the Goldman, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, perimeter. But off late, uh, I have customized a couple of uh, uh, testing with the hope of improving that. Yes, definitely. I mean, in Germany, they have so much of work done with semi-automatic as well as automatic, uh, I mean, kinetic programs, which they do, which is excellent. But mostly we use static. I think it's probably the lack of time because in India, we, we have to scale up our volumes for what we do. And I think that's so true. My for, experience is not so much. Yeah, I think that's true probably for a lot of places in the world. Um, maybe if I may add to that, I think what I see, what I see across the world is a kind of three different practices and typically a clinic picks one uh, for end stage, at least glaucoma, either to move to macular program yes. or to a stimulus five or to kinetic. And I think the benefit of kinetic is as a moving target, it's very easy to see, but yes. it needs you to have, have the ability to perform kinetic. But leads me to a different question um, on the, okay, when do you, when do you go in end stage glaucoma to a stimulus five as opposed to when do you switch to a macular program? That's a very interesting question. See, when the false negatives are, are high, right. it's not that that area is completely scotomatous from what we ask our patients. They do see something. It's not as bright. For example, this lady who came with 38 millimeters of uh, mercury, she came walking into the clinic quite fast the next day after the IOP was controlled. And she said, I'm feeling much better. I'm still wondering that when you have 10 degree fields in both eyes, which is very tiny, how do you say it is so good? So it's not that we are measuring all the visual function. We, we are just having a surrogate to help us to decide. Yes, I would use uh, the macula program, the M2. I use that very frequently, especially in end stages. That was one of the choice I had. But I would also like to see how the big picture is and how these patients are managing. And I, I typically, we ask them questions, whether they knock into doors, you know, the door sides and things. And they say, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm ambulant in my house and I'm fine. Mm -hmm. So it's always intriguing me. What is it that they actually see? So I think the size five stimulus may also answer a few of those questions. You can mix and match. Again, it's a clinical decision you've got to make. If there's going to be a large number of, uh, you know, I mean, actually false negatives, that is when you switch. You increase the dynamic range. So you make the patient see that, see, we are testing sick cells. These retinal ganglion cells are sick. Even the normative ones, because apropt I mean, the apoptosis is occurring. Mm -hmm. So there is going to be a dynamic range, which is not the same as you would see in a size three. So a flat frequency of seeing curve with size three is quite different from a flat frequency of seeing curve in size five. So that adds to your information. Yes, I think, that, I think that's a very valid point, right? Uh, quality of life is definitely not just a 10 degree, e even not just a 30 degree. So if we, um, if we want to be like very, super precise. Well, um, there are no more questions unless somebody gets a very inquisitive right now. Um, uh, Elsa, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Rangaraj, for being with us today. It was a great pleasure. Also, thank you for um, stepping in on such short notice. Um, for, for the audience, I'd like to highlight again the resources available to you, um, the other talks that you can watch on our YouTube channel. We will send you a follow-up email with a link to those, those resources. Um, and just before you go, when you step out of this uh, presentation, there's going to be a very quick, quick uh, survey on how you like the talk. Um, and we would really appreciate to hear from you how much you enjoyed it, uh, what you loved, and what we can do better. Um, it's always something we can do better. We appreciate to hear that. And again, uh, thank you very much um, to all participants. And thank you, Dr. Rangraj, for being okay. with us here I'm today. From India. Thank you. Bye -bye. Goodbye, everyone.